The Trouble with Ollie, Part 3 During early filming of the movie Castaway, Oliver seemed obsessed with his co-star Amanda Donahue and kept saying, Simon, when we're in the Seychelles, I'm going to shag Amanda. Oh yes, she will yield to my midnight serenades. I replied something like, uh, Boss, I'm not so sure that'll go down too well. Uh, besides, you yourself claim to have a singing voice like a rugby player. Simon, I'm not going to sing to her, you nitwit. I'm going to invite her for drinky poos and give her a damn good singing too. Although they weren't invented at that time, I recall making a face rather like this emoji. I just looked up Oliver Reed singing, and wow, I was really shocked by what I heard. It was nothing like his description. Here's a sample. be lonely for a girl This special kind of girl Like the girl I need For me For me Just for me Take that Rubbish off, Simon, for God's sake, boy. I thought you had better musical taste. Well, it was you, boss. Oh, God, don't remind me of that girly crooning. Now let's fuck off down the pub, you little shit. Alerting Amanda of Oliver's carnal intentions, he would most likely term as letting the team down but I felt obliged to discreetly tip her off and strongly advised her to get a hotel as far away as possible from Oliver's. I was pleased to hear that from all accounts she got away unscathed, but to be honest, I doubt she was really in that much danger, as if he was sober he would have been far too shy, and if drunk he would probably have preferred a game of tiddlywinks with the lads down the pub. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it, Simon? There was probably no need to snitch on me, after all. Amanda was similar to the comedian Pamela Stevenson in that she always referred to me as just by my surname, Drake. Back then, Drake wasn't associated with the most downloaded artist on Spotify, and I had no idea when I picked Simon Drake as a temporary stage name at that time that Drek was Yiddish for muck, or indeed shit. Not a wise move to change your name to Simon Shit in an industry largely controlled by Jewish studio bosses, producers and casting directors. Anyway, that beardy bastard Drake messed up your Google search, although Google hadn't been invented in my day. Uh, yes, I realise that, boss, so why did you say it? I'm a ghost, obviously, Simon, you nebbish. What? Simon, don't you know the difference between a nebbish and a schnorrer? Uh, no, uh, not really. Not really? You either do or you don't. A nebbish is someone who goes around dropping things, and a schnorrer is someone who goes around picking things up. Let's face it, Simon, you're not a very good Jew, are you? Um, well, boss, I think we covered that in part one. Oh yes, Simon, part one. That seems like a lifetime ago now. I wonder if anyone cares, or, or even actually remembers me. Oh, good God, Oliver, yes, they certainly remember you. And um, on the Oliver Reed Facebook groups, there are women still swooning over you. Oh, that's lovely to hear, Simon. Hello, girlies. That uh, Oliver acted like a male chauvinist, there is little doubt. Although he did enjoy playing up to that image to piss off feminists and to keep up his... Sort of blokes in the pub, macho facade. Allegedly, he once said, My ideal woman is a deaf and dumb nymphomaniac whose papa owns a huge chain of off-licenses. 
Yes, sadly, he could be pretty offensive towards women, which brings to mind his appearance on some late-night chat show. I just found an amusing article in the brilliant uh, Private Eye magazine, which I shall recite from as it encapsulated the whole sorry episode brilliantly. The production company, Op Media, would seem to be a lot less open with information than, than, than one would expect and is desperately covering up a dreadful lapse in its internal security. Viewers of last Saturday's edition of the increasingly dreadful After Dark will have witnessed an unexpected ra raising of the intellectual climate as white wine expert Oliver Reed announced... I will whack my plonker on the table unless I'm supplied with mushy peas instantly. In between addressing radical feminist Kate Millett as Oi, big tits. <laughs> Jesus. But such imbecility paled into insignificance next to the flying circus proceeding in the studio gallery among the production staff, who, despite the constant use of television's taboo C-word, were unable to make a decision to take the programme off air. Luckily, a bored hoaxer, an amateur programme planner, watching the programme, decided to make an editorial decision himself, blagged the producer Sebastian Coe's Cody's direct line from Channel 4's reception and telephoned the gallery impersonating Lord Rees Mogg of the BSC. He announced that Michael Gray was furious and then uttered the mystical words, He wants this bloody shambles off air now! Without a moment's hesitation or any attempt to check credentials, the hoaxer was amazed to hear the words, Yes, sir, and moments later to see his own TV screen go blank. This gives a whole new meaning to the phrase public access television. Open media producer Sebastian Cody has subsequently been attempting to persuade Channel 4 that he responsibly took the programme off air to sort out Mr Reed. This is a complete lie, and Michael Grade is so incensed by the whole lamentable farrago that he is said to be close to axing the show for good. Anyway, back to some other madness that occurred on location in the Seychelles. Ollie's stunt double, Reg Prince, rather tragically broke his back, falling over a balustrade into shallow seawater. I wasn't there, but I heard that Oliver had pushed him, in fact. When being questioned in court on Reg's damages claim, Oliver denied allegations of a deliberate and reckless lack of care and was taken through a hefty wad of press cuttings about his alleged exploits by Reg's barrister. One report was that he drank 104 pints of beer in two days before his marriage to Josephine. Ollie remarked, that was probably exaggerated. Newspapers carried stories about Hellraiser Ollie just to increase their bloody sales. He also denied Mr Prince's allegation that one of the, his party tricks was to show his tattoos, including a tattoo of eagle's claws perched on the end of his penis, uh, which I think I covered quite well in part two. Oliver also said, It's not true that I broke Mr. Prince's nose during a party in Mexico. However, I did give snooker player Alex Higgins a glass of his wife's Chanel No. 5 perfume. He drank it as a challenge, but spat it out. I thought, cowardly of him. Damn fine snooky player he was. Alex is very soft and also very nervous, and those people that are very nervous are very soft. If not, they become murderers. The lawyer also said, Mr. Reed, with the eyes of a crazed dog, threw a punch and tried to headbutt fellow actor Patrick Mower. Ollie said, I just leaned over the table to give Mr. Mower a kiss. Our heads, our, our heads may have met. Oliver went on to declare, I once wee weed three pints into milk bottles at a friend's wedding for a bet. Uh, Oh dear. Asked, asked about his behaviour in restaurants, he said, I think I wee-weed in a wine bottle and put it back on the table, hoping someone would drink it. And I think uh, Reg has done the same thing to me, I think on more than one occasion, and I did drink it. Uh, the judge went on to question further, and Ollie said, I would push someone into a swimming pool, but not over a balustrade. Oh dear me, definitely not. 
Anyway, the judge uh, dismissed the case, saying, They both drank uh, some pretty lethal atomic concoctions, so no one could be relied upon to recollect accurate accounts. Also, probably the maddest story on location in the Seychelles was Ollie's hotel was situated uh, next to an air the airport and allegedly, while exceptionally drunk, he ran onto the runway and attacked a, pl a plane which was coming into land, which had to then make an emergency manoeuvre. Anyway, Oliver never acted on stage in his life and I asked him why and he said, It's simple, dear boy. By 7pm I'm far too gone to act decently and would prefer to be in the pub with my mates. So, to sum up Oliver Reed's character, in my opinion, I think he was shy and to, to some extent he lacked self-confidence. That's one reason he so often drank. The other was drink helped him play some kind of warped version of what he perceived the public thought Oliver Reed should be. But easily the main reason he drank so much was that above everything he loved the company of down-to-earth people in pubs who treated him like a chum and not as a movie star. Simply put, he was like an overgrown, exceedingly naughty schoolboy with his stunts, practical jokes and indecent, indecent exposures of which I doubt contained any perverse aspect. It was all just fun and japes to him. I saw him on set many times, having had hardly any sleep and very hungover, but he always knew his lines and his acting was always on the money. Each take slightly varied, but all were great. In spite of his Edwardian views on feminism, a homophobic attitudes, which I suspect masked a covert aberration of men, underneath he was a gentle and generous soul. For years after my work with him, although one can't really call it work, I received a Christmas card signed Josephine in lovely writing and the word Oliver, as if it had been written by a six-year-old. And it was generally as I was leaving that he would say, Hold on, Simon, I've got something for you. And he'd scamper off excitedly to fetch a gift. Amongst other things, he gave me this amazing French advertising print mounted on wood, which covers a secret passage in my London venue now. I think it's an ad for a book about spiritualism, the occult and masonry. Notably, it's a huge demon towering over a group of terrified bystanders perhaps an ironic metaphor of Ollie's off-screen life. Also, he kindly gave me this automaton of a little a drunk leaning against a lamppost. I had to repeatedly clean it with mess, as it was literally black with years of cigarette smoke and grime as it had been overlooking his drinking den for decades. Imagine the scenes of drunken debauchery with Keith Moon, Richard Harris, Peter O'Toole and countless others that this, this, this little man would have witnessed. He gave this to me as he knew I built and collected automata. I looked it up and he's lost his cigar and hip flask. Um, this, this object so seems to contain another sort of subtle message in that it's clearly a drunk sitting on dustbins in, in the street and has, but has almost the face of a boy, not a man. As I said, Oliver was like an overgrown naughty schoolboy. I value these precious reminders to this day of an unforgettable time with one of the greatest movie actors of all time. Thank you for listening. They're not listening, Simon, you idiot. They're watching, and they're watching most intently. Now come along, dear boy, let's go to the cider shed, and if you look carefully, you can see I carved some initials on the barrel. Anyway, as I was saying, some of this cider is really very old, and the ones with the mould are sort of the really strongest ones. Oh, no, bloody hell, but what, 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 what? As most of you know, Ollie died during the shooting of Ridley Scott's Gladiator. It was a Sunday morning, and he was with Josephine in an English pub in Malta and was invited by sailors from the frigate HMS Cumberland to join them in a drinking competition. He could have left and probably should have left, but Ollie was, well, Ollie, and <sighs> as much of the world do, I miss him, and I'll never forget him. Goodbye, boss. Oh, goodbye, Simon, and thank you for your kindness and honesty. Now stop all this soppy bollocks and show me some more bloody magic tricks.